Good evening. My name is John Milburn. This is Laws 11057, Introduction to Law. This is week seven of term three, 2015. And um, tonight we are dealing with some issues um, relating to legal thinking, communication, collaboration, self-management, and working our way into issues to do with access to justice. Before we left for the break, we were talking about the way in which lawyers go about thinking through problems and helping people. Unlike what you might expect, law does require a considerable degree of creative thinking. So as a practising lawyer, you need to be creative. You need to think about what options might be available to a client and how you might assist that client in dealing with a range of issues of potential concern. So we need to be creative. This is examinable. Um, and as a lawyer, you're required to identify a range of different options for a legal problem or maybe think about a different way to resolve a dispute. Later, we'll be talking about brainstorming sessions and I'll, we'll actually go through um, a brainstorming session, as I call it. At page 299 of your text, which is at the tail end of chapter eight, you'll see by way of revision, a number of questions in relation to critical thinking and it leads into creative thinking. Have a look at those questions and ask yourself as you're going through the revision questions, how can I become a more critical, a better critical thinker and how can I become a creative thinker? You'll see the comments at um, the tail end of page 299 that I totally endorsed and that is that creative thinking is typically understanding a way to of look look at a problem and situation from fresh perspective and identify innovative or unorthodox solutions and ideas. When I studied law, I did so in very much a compartmentalised fashion. I did contracts, I did law, I did crim, and there was very little crossover. What we need to do is make you aware of the need to consider the crossovers at this introductory stage. So that, of course, when you're studying contract law, you're thinking primarily of contract law, but you're thinking of other issues such as consumer law um, and, uh, and even criminal law can come into it. So you need to be creative and think laterally. What I'm going to do now is open it up for you online to assist me in coming up with some ways that creativity in law might be improved. So please feel free to unmute your microphone and come in and make uh, a comment live or use the chat facility. So what I'm looking for are ideas about how you might be more creative in legal practice or how can creativity in law be improved. Use of mild, mild, mind-altering drugs is not an acceptable answer. So how else can we be creative? Um, I'll make a start. We use the internet. You know, we can find some creative options just by Googling. Not a very sophisticated option, but it's an option. How else can we be creative? If you're in a legal situation, thinking outside the box, thank you, Matt. So we can look at the internet for ideas. We can think outside the box. How else can we be creative? How can we come up with creative ideas for a client? Talk to others from different areas of law. I like that answer, thank you, Lou. So that's a different way of doing things. Form some associations. Um, talk to others who practice in different areas and get a feel for it. How else can you become more creative? Collaborate, yes, thank you, that's a very good answer. Collaboration is important in law. So you want to be creative, you want to come up with new ideas in a chosen area of practice. What would you do to become more creative? How could you improve your creativity? What about viewing people that are actually in practice? So if you want to be a criminal law barrister, for example, perhaps you could increase your creativity skills by just simply observing a criminal law practitioner in practice. So these are various options that might be available to you going to court tomorrow, that's it. So just think outside looking at your textbook, 
think about different ways that you can become more creative. I didn't expect any major answers tonight, but this is all examinable. So um, we need you to start thinking about different ways that you can do this. So discussing techniques of reading people with a psychologist. I really like that answer. That's good. So you're looking at it, bringing in a completely different discipline altogether. So there are various options for you. All right, let's move on to a different topic completely. Oh, Heidi says, I've been watching Making a Murderer. It's a documentary about Stephen Avery's case. So, I'm um, sorry, that was privately. Sorry, Heidi. <laughs> um, my apologies. So let's move on to a different area. I, I just want to talk about judicial activism. I know it's a complete break to what we've been talking about. In your textbook, it's from 384 to 386. Um, and this is where a judge, or more likely a number of judges in the High Court, reform the law. Um, that is a law if it's considered to be unjust or defective. So every day, judges through precedent, which is common law, they do make law, but judicial activism is different. It's more akin to a reform. So it's more big ticket items. I mean, the lead example, the one that always comes to my mind is the Mabo. And in the Mabo decision, the High Court recognised the existence of native title, and in doing so, brought to an end the fiction of terra nullius. So that's judicial activism. That's a, a major reform created through judges, not created through parliament. There are many critics, people that consider judicial activism not necessarily the right way to go. A number of reasons for that. Judi judicial activism might be regarded as acting retrospectively. Or critics might say that judges are second-rate lawmakers. They're not good policy makers. And, of course, there's always the perennial problem as to whether judicial activism itself offends the separation of powers doctrine. So think about judicial activism. It is examinable, and um, you need to think about what it means, but also um, what are examples and uh, what it might mean for the future, and also whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, your thoughts are important um, in law, so I'm very keen for you to express your thoughts and feel free to do that in the exam. But always have it backed up. And bear in mind, of course, that if you're um, making submissions to a court, the court, and I know this is a bit contrary to what I've been saying, but a court isn't necessarily interested in your opinion. Uh, the court is interested in your submissions. So if you're addressing a court, you don't say, I think, or this is the answer. What you do is you say, in my submission, this is the case. So I hope that you understand that subtle difference. You're still being creative, you're still coming up with ideas, but you're doing it in a manner that is not regarded as offensive to the court. Okay, um, now moving on to different things, communication and collaboration skills. This is chapter nine of your text, and uh, it's pages 305 to 342. When it comes to referencing, as you know, you need to consider and apply the Australian Guide to Legal Citations. So there's not, you must understand that there's not one single style of referencing in Australia, but the one that we adopt and the one that is very commonly adopted is the one that you'll find through the Melbourne University Law Review and it's the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. If you haven't had a look, I urge you to do so. I think currently we're up to the third edition. Um, and the first place that you, you might look in that um, guide, if you haven't already done so, is go to the back um, or towards the back and you'll see the Quick Reference Guide to Citation. And that is, give you a, a prompt for the more commonly used uh, materials in legal studies. So please have a look at that and get to know it. Um, there's a lot of material on referencing. Uh, there's some good textbooks, um, Legal Referencing by uh, Anita Stumick, Alexis Nexus, um, Enid Campbell, Richard Fox have a Student's Guide to Legal Writing and Law, law Exams. So, so there's a few different ones and um, you'll find a lot of material to assist you in understanding the Legal Guide to, so the Australian Guide to Legal Citations. Are there any questions about that? And I know I'm moving pretty quickly, 
but I'm identifying key areas that I want you to understand. Okay, um, now let's have a look at page 307 of the text. Appreciate I'm jumping around a little bit, that's what we do. 307, there's some things there that I, that I want you to take note of. And um, on page 307, the first paragraph at the top of the page, I really like this. So have a look at the short sentences at the start of the paragraph. Then below that, look at the list that relates to the threshold learning outcome five. I'm going to ask you two things. The first is, did you notice in the first paragraph the sentences are very short, easily comprehended, and it makes for easy reading? It's not necessarily basic reading. The material which is contained within that paragraph is not necessarily easy to digest, but the way in which the authors have written it makes it as easy for you to understand as possible. And unlike the situation in law many years ago, where almost intentionally lawyers seem to want to confuse people, perhaps to show how intelligent they were or how difficult law is, we just don't do that now. We try and simplify things. So use those short sentences, and I think that's an example of a good paragraph. Now, conversely, you probably know that I'm not a great fan of lists. And one of the reasons I think that I tend to switch off with lists, others may not. You may say to me, no, lists are great. I read every word and I carefully go down line by line. But with me, I tend to read the introduction to the list and go, okay, well, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that I can refer back to if I need, but I don't actually read through it. Or if I do, it might be skim reading it. Whereas a paragraph, which is written with short sentences, I tend to read it all. Now, if you have a different view, if you, you know, there's no right or wrong answer with this, and I'm just stating that's my personal view, that lists um, can be effective, but if you write with lists, be aware that you'll have people like me that will tend to gloss over them, and that's really all the, the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, so if there's any comments, let me know, otherwise I'll move on to the next topic, which is actually just at the bottom of that page. And uh, have a look at the think box. So it says, when you think of lawyers communicating, what are the first images that come to mind? Do you think of legalese, pomp, uh, jargonistic language, incomprehensible sentences, or do you think of clear and precise communication using short words, easy, easy to understand phrases? So of the two options, what do you think is more accurately reflects the nature of legal communication today? Okay, so before you started this course, feel free to jump in and um, make some comments live or use the chat facility. I mean, did you think that you would be learning to speak in the way that you thought lawyers speak, long and complicated words? Or is the way in which we're teaching you, that I'm teaching you, um, what you expected? Did you expect that I would say short sentences to the point, make it clear? Any thoughts? Okay, so just remember that thought in the first week, um, long and rambling or to the point, and always we want to the point. Okay, let's talk about something a bit more substantive. Um, let's talk about in the context of communication skills, interviewing client. Okay, so on your, ready on your buzzers, as it were. Tell me, what are the important things when it comes to interviewing a client? Off the top of your head. You're now in your first week, you're in a law firm, and one of the partners says, I would like you to interview this client in relation to a particular matter. So what are the important things that you need to bear in mind while you're interviewing that client? What comes to mind? Looking professional. I really like that answer. I don't have it written down, but I really like that. Judge what sort of person they are. I think that's excellent too. So you're making that initial assessment of them and them of you even before we start. They're really good answers. Presentation and open dialogue. Yes, present well, present professionally and use open dialogue. Make them feel comfortable. Being open to people from different backgrounds and situations. Very good answers, these. Really good. Effective listening, all like that. Communicate effectively. Use short sentences. 
make it understandable. These are really valuable points. And you might think, why are we doing this in law? Um, change your approach according to the client's reactions. Yes, I think that's, be flexible. That's a really good point. I'm going to have to re-watch this video so I can get these points down. There's some excellent ones. Summarise regularly. I like that. Body language. That's good. This is really good stuff. Excellent answers here tonight. Different to the ones we normally get. Paraphrase to ensure correct message. Yes, paraphrasing, reframing, summarising. These are all valuable techniques. We use them in mediations a lot. Um, Detoxification is another one too. So a client comes in, they're all steamed up and they, and, they, and they want to make a point, but they're being very abusive of their neighbour, for example. So, um, you know, that so-and-so is always such and such. So you reframe it by um, take, stripping out the emotive part and saying, so having a quiet environment is important to you. So things of that nature. So they're really good answers. Um, so I hope that you are able to get some of those down. I'll go through a few things that I've written down. Um, think about the object of communication. Understand what do you want. So when you're speaking to a client, you know, what do you want and what do you want me to do? So be very clear with the clients. Be upfront without being rude. But listen very carefully. And when I mean listen, I mean active listening. Part of active listening is don't jump in too early, and but say what is needed. Face to face, if you if you're in a face to face situation, um, be comfortable, be authoritative, maintain eye contact, be attentive, respectful, and as the point was made in what you were saying, clarify and do that by reframing and summarising. Reframing is where you take something and rework it, stripping the emotion and presenting it back by way of um, um, a statement. Empathise, yes. All right, now, take notes selectively. This is really tricky. You've got a client, you want to maintain eye contact, but you want to ensure that you have an accurate record of what is being said and the advice that you're giving. It's a real art to do this. How do you get something on paper and also maintain eye contact and maintain that link with the client so the client feels connected. Are there any thoughts? Paper without lines, yes, that's nice. I, I like these ideas. Active listening, yep. So how do you record decent notes at the same time that you're maintaining eye contact and showing interest? Shorthand, yep, if you can do it. And it's really hard, sometimes you have to write Blind, record the interview, voice recorder. Yes, you can raise that. You need to get consent. Have a paralegal taking notes. Yes, that's an option. Um, and it might be useful in circumstances where you need someone to provide evidence as to what was said, if it's really contentious. A bit easier for a barrister, because if you've got a barrister, you'll have an instructor there taking notes. So, yeah, as a solicitor, why not have a paralegal taking notes if you need to? Um, it probably will come as no surprise to you that what I use is voice recognition software so that um, I've developed a little skill, if you like, of being able to hit the on-off button without the client necessarily um, seeing me do that. Um, well, they probably can, but they probably don't tweak to it. So in the course of my summarising or reframing, I'm actually recording that um, through voice recognition. So it's a great way of both maintaining eye contact but also getting down the proper notes. You know, I need to tidy them up afterwards, mind you, but it is a good way of doing it. Touch typists have, an, a, a, have a great advantage too because, of course, they can maintain the contact, eye contact and still type. So these are different techniques, but you need to think about it and think about it in the context of you're not a law student now, you're in your first week in a law firm, what are you going to do? And you'll see a lot of my exam questions sort of follow that familiar type theme. Okay, other things that you need to do during that interview, ensure your client is aware of um, obligations regarding confidentiality. That's all part of making sure that the client is comfortable and confident in what you're doing. Confirm the instructions or writing or evidence of the interview. If, for example, you're taking instructions from a client to um, make an offer to another party in a litigation matter, 
or draft a document that might become a contract or take instructions to enter a plea of guilty or have the client enter a plea of guilty for a sentence, you need to, in some circumstances, ask your client to provide instructions with, in writing. And um, part of the reason you do that is to ensure that there is no misunderstanding and that you're covered in the event of an issue arising. Sometimes you can prepare those instructions on the run, but other times you might want to use a pro forma. So part of the preparation for the interview might be to say, okay, this is to do with um, in taking instructions for the preparation of a power of attorney. Rather than simply have a blank sheet, why not have a pro forma instruction sheet that you can work from and then maybe take notes in the relevant sections, either in writing, handwritten, or it might be an electronic document that you record. So I would have thought that the very first thing you do is you try and ascertain the nature of the interview and see if there's a pro forma instruction sheet. And there might be some pro forma uh, interview, client interview forms as well. So keep that in mind. Um, Lexon has some excellent material available when it comes to um, ensuring that you ask the right question and you ask all the right questions and you obtain appropriate instructions from your client. Um, so sometimes you need, and Luke said you need empathy, that's absolutely right. And you need to let the clients talk, you don't want to jump in too quickly, but sometimes, in fact very often, you need to bring the clients back to earth, okay? Um, in my criminal law practice, I sometimes have the pleasure of interviewing clients that are clearly under the influence, and you've got to be very careful, of course, in those circumstances. And as I say, sometimes I feel like I'm plucking them off the ceiling, so come on, back to earth now. Um, and if they're, if they're really in a bad way, then um, I'll discontinue the interview, of course, and invite them back. But other times clients are just simply emotional or, or they, they, they're going on about issues that are really tangential to the main issue. So you need to bring the clients back. You need to question appropriately. You need to show good advocacy practice. Ask one question at a time. Make sure that the question has one question and is not double barreled. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, just a quick question. Um, in the exam, we're required to reference our answers. Yes, you are required to reference in the exam, but you don't have to go with the Australian Guide to Legal Citations with footnotes. So you can just use what we call Harvard referencing, which is, um, you know, if you, if you have a quote from the new lawyer, page 299, just at the end of the quote, put the new lawyer, page 299. I'm not really fussed about, you don't even have to put in the full citation for me in the exam. I'm, I'm mostly really just concerned to ensure that you have acknowledged the source of the work. And we all know what the new lawyer is, so you don't have to tell me it's James and Field. Now, other examiners may have different views, uh, so check with your specific examiner as to their preference. I'm interested in what you have to say. I'm interested in ensuring that you properly reference your material to the appropriate author, but I'm not too worried about the form in the exam. In the assignments I am, but not the exam. Um, anyway, coming back to the questioning of um, uh, clients, make sure that there's a single question, not a double barreled. So, for example, if you said, um, so was the red car speeding? Unless you've established what the red car is, it's double barreled because it may be that you need two questions. You know, what was the, and it might be an open question, what colour was the car? Or it might be a closed question, was the car red in colour? And then the second question might be, was the car speeding? Or it might be um, an open question, can you tell me something about the speed at which the, the car was being driven? So do you, do you understand that, that what I've said there is questions, one question at a time, not double barrel, and you can choose whether you're asking open questions or closed questions. And open questions are those where you're inviting the person to comment generally, sort of freely. Uh, you're not suggesting the answer. Or a closed question 
is one where the responder can say yes or no to adequately answer the question. Okay, uh, keep the question short, um, use the active rather than passive voice. I think we've talked about that before. Um, take action. Um, so when you're interviewing the client, you need to discuss and consider the options that might be available to the client, negotiation, mediation, um, litigation, etc. We, and this is still in the context of interviewing a client. It's all examinable. Um, the other thing is that you might want to, in your own mind, think about the client's interests as opposed to the client's position. And what do I mean by that? Um, a client's position, say in a workplace situation, might be, I should be, I should receive a pay rise. That's my position. I, I should get a pay rise. My interest might be to get more recognition within the company. So what I'm really interested in is having someone acknowledge my worth. That's, that's my interest. My position is I want more money. So in a mediation, particularly, the mediator will work towards trying to assist the parties in ascertaining their true interests as opposed to necessarily their, their positions. So in an interview situation, you might want to consider doing the same thing. Um, well now, I'm going to talk briefly about a different communication context, and that is courtroom advocacy. So again, if we've got our thinking caps on, I now want you to think that you are in a courtroom, it's your first appearance, you're nervous, we need to run through a few things. So what do we need to consider before we move into the courtroom and while we're on our feet. Can anyone think of some things that are important from a communication perspective and a preparedness perspective? Okay, you need to know how to approach or speak to the judge or judges. That's an excellent thing. So that when you're on your feet, you're confident, yes, I know how to address you. Does anyone know the appropriate address in court before a judge, Your Honour, absolutely correct. Before a magistrate? What's the appropriate address before a magistrate? Sir, no. Judge, no. Magistrate, no. In court, if you're addressing a magistrate, the answer is exactly the same as a judge, Your Honour. We used to say, years ago, we used to say worship. And so I was practising when they made the transition, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, and the, the running joke was that every time a practitioner said your worship, it was like 20 cents into the tin until we got it right. Um, but yes, your, your honour is the appropriate address inside a courtroom. What if you see a judge at a private function? How do you address a judge in a private function? So let's say you, you're at your first... Queensland Law Society, the same way is acceptable. You can say you're wrong. Judge, yes, that's what I'm after. Oh, Judge X, no, just judge. So what you would say is, um, good afternoon, judge, or good morning, judge. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it tends to be more the people in the profession. Uh, but in, in the courtroom, it's always your honour. Um, what else do you need to do? when you're going into a courtroom or you're on your feet in a courtroom. Are there any thoughts? Don't undermine the opposition. Yes, know the process. Yep. So you need to be prepared before you walk in. Know your facts. I like that as well. Thank you. Body language again, take an oath. Not necessarily. If you're an advocate, you won't necessarily take an oath. But um, you certainly will invite a client to do that if they go into the witness box. Okay, some very good answers there, thank you. Let me just offer a few suggestions. The first, and this has been covered, be prepared. Um, part of the preparation might be having the legislation available, maybe even having a copy of the legislation for your opponent and a copy for the court. Maybe that's part of the preparedness. Maybe part of the preparation is to have a pro forma instruction sheet. I mean, I do, 
I've, I've just made my own. So when I go into court, I know where things are on my client instruction sheet. Another way is to think about how you're going to address the court. Um, you know, that whole IRAC thing, identify the issues, the rules that apply, come to your conclusions. If you're preparing a submission to a court, maybe what you, you might decide to do is state your conclusion first um, and then work towards that. So tell the court what it is that you seek to achieve from the outset so the court says, all right, well, I know what you're trying to achieve. Now yeah, let's see if you can do it. And then you can work towards that objective rather than have the court guess where you're leading with all this. Um, so as part of the preparation, take your instructions in a form that you can rely upon under pressure. So just be very careful about having a blank sheet with lots of words all over the place. Um, maybe you take some time to prepare a little checklist and then you get into that format where you can understand what you've written to yourself uh, when you're under pressure. Um, obviously, undertake research before you go in. Have your law available in a written form that we talked about before. Make necessary concessions. Consider the alternate argument. People did say you've got to um, uh, deal with your opponent in an appropriate manner. Look, sometimes it's a really good idea to prepare written submissions and a draft order. So if you're going to say something before a court, why not have some written submissions prepared that you can then hand up, takes the pressure off you. The court can read that and you can talk to your submission. So, um, you know, the court's looking at your submissions as you're going through it. Uh, so that, that might take a lot of pressure off. Um, or a draft order. If you, if, you, if you say in a family law proceeding on an interim basis, um, you're, you know, Your Honour, I respectfully um, urge the court to consider a certain order. I've taken the liberty of preparing a draft for Your Honour's consideration. You do that and you've got the, the judge thinking, okay, now we're looking at your document, we're thinking your way and maybe making adjust, adjustments to that. Of course, one thing I haven't said is you need to announce your appearance. Now, does anyone know how to announce an appearance? Let's assume that you're a first year solicitor, you're on your feet for the first time, you don't say, judge, it's me, Jim, Mary here, um, I act for, what's the appropriate procedure? What's the wording that we use for a solicitor? Any ideas? Surname initials, yes. So in my case, um, Milburn initials JA, yes. And you announce that you're um, a solicitor. I tend to say lawyer, but I guess I say it so often, sometimes I actually forget what I do say. It just come, it just pops out. But um, so I would say Milburn, J.A., lawyer of Milburn's Law, appearing for the applicant, for the defendant, etc. So just to, um, along those lines. So just work out your little spiel and have it ready. Just practice that from time to time so that when the time comes, you're ready to go. When you announce your appearance, do so in a confident, unrushed manner, um, and, then, uh, and then deal with the specific matter that you might have before you. Uh, all right, so are there any questions on that? All easy? And I appreciate that we're moving pretty quickly tonight, but we've got a little bit of catching up to do. All right, let's talk about written communication. Your written communication needs to be professionally presented. And you know that from the feedback I've given on the first assessment, you know that I want this to be professionally assessed, um, presented. Again, if you're charging $400 an hour, people expect it to look a certain way. So that's easy, but that's the easy part. Um, so get that right. Make sure your document is well referenced. And then we come to the way you write. Well, obviously write logically. You know, don't leave people guessing. Don't Avoid a situation where you said you say something like uh, he then ran he he then ran at the other fellow um, and took off down the street. And people say, well, who's he? Who's the other fellow? What street are you talking about? So be specific within the context of short sentences. 
make sure that the content is understandable to the reader. So a sentence does not cause the reader to ask him or herself three other questions uh, that lead from that sentence. So write plainly, be concise, write in the active voice. Jim told the tribunal that the victim lost consciousness. Thumbs up. The tribunal was told by Jim that the victim lost consciousness. No, thumbs down, that's passive. So the active voice tends to commence with the active player. Jim told the tribunal, that's active. The tribunal was told by Jim, that's passive. So, and Word, Word will train you to work right in the uh, active voice if you leave all your settings on. So change the settings in Word to assist you. Have I shown you the settings before? So you just go, if you're using Word, go to File on the top left-hand side. I should screen share this, but I won't. But Options and then um, Proofing. And you can just recheck the document. Um, the writing style, you, you can either choose to go with just grammar and style or grammar only. But um, do that. Um, it's important to, uh, to get that right. Okay, so in your written communication, plan your thoughts. Use headings. There's nothing all wrong, at all wrong with headings. You see that very often in documents and letters, and I think it's a good thing. Uh, write professionally. Try not to write too many words. Keep it as concise as you can. Oh, and um, sometimes we see like a document that just kind of shouts at you. And you think, why, why is someone, why is this person shouting at me? By that I mean there's um, overcapitalization, unnecessary underlining. I mean, by all means, use a different font or maybe use bold or italics, but do it selectively and professionally. You know, don't, no need to shout in a document. Um, and a short document often takes longer time to prepare than a longer one. Avoid some old fashioned words. There are some, I get I cringe when I see a letter from a colleague that uh, says, I, I refer to my letter to you, 15 Ultimo or 27 Instant. What are you, what are you talking about? I mean, these are old fashioned ways of describing months and days. And, you know, we just, you, you see, we see that a lot less now. In the last 10 years, much of that is gone. Um, have, has anyone attempted, just a quick poll, has anyone attempted to redraft what I call gobbledygook? Because you know that's going to be in the exam, so you might as well try it. It's pretty tough on this year, I'm afraid. It's a different style. So, yes, so you've had a redraft. We're going to actually do that, I think, in about week nine or ten. Not yet. Have it, Give it a go um, from the exam. Yeah, have a look at past exams. That's a really good way to do it. So. Um, just see how difficult it is to redraft. But once you've done it a few times, you get the idea. And just to give you an idea, a guide, what I like to do is maybe highlight the main words and at the same time dismiss the things that really aren't relevant. Um, now, there's not a lot of redrafting as such in the um, textbook. The textbook provides some great examples of good writing, but doesn't necessarily ask you to take that task of taking bad writing and converting it. So that's probably more for the exams and, uh, and we'll do an exercise on that later as well. Um, in chapter nine, um, there's a redrafting exercise. So, oh, okay, no, I'll, I'll have to, I'll go through that at another stage. So I'll just highlight that in my notes. All right, um, and of course, from time to time in legal practice, you need to draft documents of a different style. So there might be file notes, we talked about that earlier tonight. Uh, you may have to prepare written statements. You may have to prepare affidavits or stat decks or deeds or other, other documents of that nature. Okay, well, we're just about ready to wrap up tonight. So thank you, it's been quite a long session. Thank you for hanging, hanging in there. What I'd like to do next week is talk about some issues to do with writing well um, and go on to talk about collaborating, some self-management skills, 
and, um, and then we'll get on to issues to do with access to justice. So before I wrap up, are there any final questions or comments? Okay. Well, again, thanks for your patience tonight. We'll stop the recording now and we'll see you next week. All the best.